Firstly, I'd like to thank Mingwei and UCL, UCL for inviting me to come along and speak to you all today. Um, and of course also to the Heritage Lottery Fund who have been very generous in their donation to, or their grant to the National Army Museum for our redevelopment program we're doing at the moment. Can you hear me? Sounds like we're talking now. Okay. Um, today I'm going to speak to you um, about China's relationship with the West and in particular the impact that the world wars have had on um, that relationship and the ongoing legacy. To really understand it, um, we need to go back to Qing Dynasty China when the West first started coming into contact. Um, sorry, when the West first started coming into contact with China. Um, Imperial China reached its greatest extent during this period um, and covered. Uh, it expanded westward towards. It just needs to be um, the antenna needs to be out. Can I take the location? No. I think it's the mic. Flip, flip the mic on your... Yeah. Maybe higher. Sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. we'll try again. Okay. Um, so, Qing Dynasty China um, began a westward expansion into Central Asia, grew to its greatest extent, encompassing, um, as you can see, a very large list of modern nations, and with a population of over 400 million, um, was one of the world's largest countries at that time. But the rapid growth also meant um, maintaining a centralised control was very difficult. And um, the Qing dynasty began to experience a lot of problems with stagnating administration, uh, political corruption, um, and they had a policy of fixed low taxation which led to economic declines. Additionally, there were food shortages and famine. Um, and in the face of growing external mercantile and political interference, it became very difficult for China to maintain its position uh, of authority in the face of Western interest. Under Hung Li, the sixth emperor of the Manchu Qing dynasty, he proclaimed China to be the central kingdom to which all other nations were tributary, and that automatically brought him into conflict with uh, Western mercantile interests growing in Asia. China's initial refusal to allow the importation of European goods and restriction of European traders to Canton's 13 factories eventually led to the Opium Wars against Britain. Uh, the British victories led to the establishment of Hong Kong as a mercantile trading base and military bastion in Asia and allowed the importation of cheap opium into China, which also had negative social consequence. If the growing European influence wasn't enough, Qing Dynasty also began to face major internal unrest, such as the Taiping Rebellion, which we've heard some of the other speakers talking about. Um, the Taiping Rebellion, incidentally, uh, over 20 million deaths during that conflict, which compared to the First World War, we consider one of the greatest uh, losses of life in military history, um, 17 million deaths. So the Taiping Rebellion actually is a larger conflict in scale than the First World War. Um, the uh, growing Western influence led to the opening up of further treaty ports um, in, in China and also growing interest amongst other Western powers. In particular, the uh, foreign dominance of Shanghai created a, a base or a bastion for Western powers to establish their influence over China. And the um, establishment first as a treaty port of Shanghai and then its change into what became known as the Shanghai International Settlement meant that other nations, including France and the United States, began to take an interest as well. So we see at the turn of the 20th century um, a, a large encroachment on Chinese territory from foreign powers, Russia in the north, Britain through India and through the treaty ports, and of course France there as well, and uh, Germany and a few other countries to a lesser extent. Um, here also we see the, uh, the main reason for that interest. Large numbers of different types of trade goods that are in high demand in Europe and European traders wanting to have uh, cheap and easy access to those goods. Um, don't need to go into this in too much detail, but essentially throughout this period, Britain in particular is imposing 
a series of very one-sided uh, treaties which are, are really uh, putting pressure on China and creating a, a very unequal situation, the unequal treaties, um, which has sometimes been referred to as China's century of humiliation. Um, however, the Americans in particular were very opposed to the approach, the imperialist approach that France and Britain were taking to China. Britain, as we had seen in other parts of the empire, very much liked to create uh, colonies within the local um, protected leaders or br direct British rule through the colonial office and create a protectionist or isolationist economy in those places where it had a, a monopoly or a dominance of the economy. The Americans, however, were very opposed to this in China. In 1899, they instigated the open door policy um, and tried to convince the other European powers that all foreign um, powers should have equal access to the Chinese market. And that more or less prevented Britain, France and Russia from establishing an outright colonization in parts of China where they had um, influence. However, the growing European influence uh, and interest in China um, was not without opposition locally. In 1899, there was, further, there was a further uprising um, when the Society of Righteous and Harmonious Fists, known as Chinese Boxers to the Western Powers, due to their practice of Chinese martial arts, um, rose up in rebellion to increasing Western economic imperialism and, Chinese and Christian missionary work in China. Um, the Emperor Daozhi Xu Ji chose to support the rebels and an eight-nation alliance of Western powers, including Japan, sent in a 20,000 strong allied army which defeated the imperial army and suppressed the boxers, um, often with brutal retributions, looting and even the committing of uh, widespread atrocities. Japan was particularly enthusiastic to impress upon its European allies that its soldiers were of equal capacity to its European allies. They'd already won territory off China, and, and including Taiwan, during the first Sino-Japanese uh, War of 1894-95. And having seen China's decline under Western interference and its capitulation in the Opium Wars, Japan had embarked on a program of modernization known as the Meiji Restoration in the 1860s, fully upgrading their military to be the equal of most European militaries, mostly under American guidance. Following the Boxer Rebellion, China also began to do the same. Here we see some Chinese soldiers circa 1907, towards the end of Empress Xi Zhi's reign. Um, they're still kowtowing in the traditional Chinese style, but now they're starting to carry modern Western rifles and wearing updated uniforms. Um, these modern soldiers were part of the Chinese army, uh, the Beiyang army, which was under the command of Wan Shikai. Um, the Boxer Uprising was one of the final blows for the Qing Dynasty. Despite maintaining, uh, so initiating reforms, the death of Xi Ji in 1908 was followed by the dynasty's collapse in 1911, replaced by the First Republic of China. The Jinhe Revolution ushered in a new central government in Nanjing, and with the collapse of the Qing, several provinces began to increasingly assert their own autonomy, threatening to even succeed and perhaps unravel China. Wan Shikai used the Beiyan army to crush a rebellion in Wuhan and then moved to become the Republic's Prime Minister. So on the eve of the First World War, China was very much under the influence of external powers. And one of those powers, Germany, ended up being an enemy of uh, Britain and France and Russia, the three other ma most major powers in the Asia-Pacific region at that time. So upon the outbreak of the First World War, we see those allies moving very quickly to try and attack and seize German possessions. In the south of the Pacific, Australia seizes German New Guinea, the Bougainville Islands and Solomon Islands, New Zealand takes Samoa, and Japan moves to take the Mariana, Marshall and Caroline Islands, which are German possessions here. And of course, Britain and uh, Japan uh, send troops into Tsingtao as well. The Japanese then occupied at Tsingtao for the duration of the First World War. Um, however, upon the end of the war, it was obliged to return it, and the Japanese weren't particularly keen to do that. They'd had a taste of having a political and influential control within China, 
and it was one that many of the imperialists within Japan felt that they should be allowed to maintain. Somewhat to the major surprise of Britain and France, Japan issued China with a list of 21 quite um, unfair demands, both over the control of those former German possessions um, and uh, through increased influence over Chinese industry, transport and, and railways, etc. Britain and the US actually objected quite strenuous, strenuously and managed to have the demands watered down to 13, still quite one-sided. But there was little China could do other than assent to them, and without Britain or America willing to directly intervene, they were forced to, to assent to those demands. However, the aggressive nature of those 21 demands very severely diminished Japan's standing with both Britain and the US and tarnished their reputation. It could be considered the end of what was a fairly successful alliance between Britain and Japan at that time. China's other major contribution, of course, to the First World War um, was the Chinese Labour Corps. Both Britain and France needed to recruit external labourers in the face of rising casualty numbers on the Western Front and doing so allowed them to free up their own labourers for fighting duties. Um, men from Egypt, Fiji, India, Malta, Mauritius, the Seychelles, South Africa and the British West Indies were all enlisted as labourers. But with the largest population, China was also one of the most attractive places for recruiters to look at. As China was not a belligerent nation, their nationals were not permitted to fight but the government was um, quite keen to show favour towards the Allies. Recruiting was done locally by British and French agents initially, but after 1917, when the Chinese decided to join the Allies, the government took responsibility for this. In all, over 100,000 Chinese men served in the First World War on the Western Front as labourers, and this was a huge contribution which, as I mentioned, freed up fighting men for Britain, France and Belgium. Um, and I believe we'll hear more about this from our next speaker. As I said, China declared war uh, in 1917. They were very keen to use the war as a tool of showing their, their, modern, their progress of modernisation, the fact that they wanted to be considered an equal uh, with the world's great powers. Um, they were already modernising their army, and of course the excuse, the Americans uh, pressurised them with the excuse of um, protesting against Germany's use of unrestricted submarine warfare attacking civilians, that all modern and civilised nations should be on the side of the Allies. However, following the death of Wan Shikai in 1916, the debate on joining the war caused the government to begin to split and factionalise. There was a brief Manchu restoration in 1917, and realising that the new world order was in the making and they couldn't afford to sit idly by, China made that decision to join the Allies. They'd initially offered 50,000 armed troops, but both Britain and France balked at the idea of a large Chinese army arriving in Europe. They did, however, send troops into the Siberian campaign of the Russian Civil War. During this period, the centralised control more or less collapsed in China and led to what's known as the Warlord Era. Rather than ushering in the, re the Republic ushering in a new period of prosperity and modern, uh, modernisation as it had been hoped, um, it actually served to further heighten the internal divisions. It became particularly fractured between the Bayan government in Pekin, uh, Pekin, the Kuomintang and the rise of the power of provincial warlords, many of which became almost autonomous in their own right. Some had been motivated by traditional values, others by trying to reunify central control under them, their own authority, and others purely by wealth and greed. They tore the country apart in a decade of constant strife. In 1916, the Bayan army was nominally over 500,000 men, but by 1928, there were over 2 million men under arms in China. The, um, the British were grateful for the Chinese Labour Corps' contribution and um, as per all uh, British Empire combatants, they were entitled to medals in recognition of their service. To the left we see the trio of medals that most British Empire servicemen would have received, certainly at least the um, centre and the right one, the War Medal and the Victory Medal. However, the Chinese Labour Corps were issued with a, a kind of a second-rate version of the British War Medal. That, the, that all labourers were given that was cast in bronze instead of silver. Um, and we know from anecdotal evidence that quite a lot of them um, 
despite the fact that Britain went to a, a large degree of effort to try and track down Chinese workers who'd returned home without having received their medals, that quite a large number of them were returned unwanted. Of course, we also see there's a Chinese cemetery uh, that commemorates the Chinese war dead of the Western Front, the largest of which is at Noyel Sumer in France. Um, the British statistics say that some 3,000 Chinese workers were killed on the Western Front or died of disease there, although the um, figure is estimated to be much higher by some scholars. In this cemetery, there are 842 graves. China had contributed very significantly to the Allied war effort and had every right to expect to be treated as one of the victors. Uh, but, uh, sorry, but their belief that in joining the peace discussions, they could expect the Shandong province that had been under German influence to be returned to Chinese control. However, it was instead transferred to Japan as a reward for their role as an ally. There was a huge sense of betrayal in China, and the May the Fourth movement we also heard about earlier rose up in protest. Only after strong US intervention was it finally returned to China in 1922, which in turn upset the Japanese, who now felt that they should be allowed to continue their control in the province. As I said before, the 21 demands Japan had issued more or less brought about the end of the Anglo-Japanese alliance. We should also remember, of course, that when we talk about relations between specific countries, we're also talking about relations between ruling authorities within those countries and the decisions of whichever party might be in power at a given time. China and Japan in the interwar years um, had a very, a very tenuous negative relationship. Japanese imperialism and expansionism continued to grow throughout the 1920s. From Korea, which they occupied in 1910, then Manchuria, they gained a foothold through victory in the Russo-Japanese War and then began exerting regional control through the expansion of the South Manchurian Railway. In 1931, they fully invaded and set up a puppet state called Manchu Kuo. The last emperor of China, Pu Yi, was installed as a puppet ruler to create legitimacy. But this, and along with several other conflicts, such as the Marco Polo Bridge incident, led to an all-out war, the Second Sino-Japanese War, which kicked off in earnest in 1937. So increasingly, in the years before the Second World War, we see Japanese um, expansion further south um, into areas such as Peking, um, Suzhou, Nan Nanking, and eventually in 1937 also Shanghai. <coughs> China's relationship with the West in this period is quite interesting as well. In 1933, the League of Nations adopted the Litton Report, declaring Manchuria remained rightfully part of China leaving Japan to re resign its membership from the League and further alienating Japan from the West. All throughout the warlord period, the United States offered support to the nationalist Kuomintang um, as the legitimate government of the Republic of China. They poured money in, in support of them and their war with Japan. Britain favoured China in their war with Japan, but was too concerned about the threat that it posed to its own possessions, such as Hong Kong and Singapore, to directly intervene. As the war began to escalate, Britain began training Chinese infantry divisions in India and permitted the US to use India to fly supplies and war planes directly into China. Britain was nearly drawn into the war during the Battle of Shanghai. As Japan moved into Shanghai, the British legation that was based there suffered casualties and four British soldiers were killed by Japanese bombing, which outraged the British government. So at the entry of the Western powers uh, following Pearl Harbor and the attack on um, Hong Kong, this is more or less the situation in China. We see a large area of China occupied by the Japanese forces, growing communist control, particularly in this area, and the nationalists in control to the south and west. I mentioned the Battle of Hong Kong. On the 8th of December 1941, the day after Japan had attacked the Americans in Pearl Harbor, they attacked Hong Kong. Despite holding out for three weeks, the 14,000 strong British, Canadian and local Hong Kong defences were unable to withstand the 50,000 strong Japanese invasion force and were obliged to surrender on Christmas Day. Despite the disastrous capitulation of Fortress Singapore, which followed eight weeks later, and its garrison of over 100,000 British, Australian, Indian, local Malay, Chinese and Singapore soldiers, 
the British Empire still continued to fight against Japan in Asia. And a large contribution was made by Hong Kong Chinese soldiers. Chinese served in a large number of different capacities in British forces and auxiliaries during the Second World War. The 14th Army, which fought in Burma, was a mixed force comprising of British um, Empire, Indian, Chinese, African uh, soldiers. During the war, local ethnic Chinese also served alongside white British residents of Hong Kong in the Hong Kong Volunteer Defence Corps, um, membering around, uh, numbering around 2,500 men. And a second Hong Kong Chinese regiment was raised as an emergency during the defence, but was soon disbanded after the fall. Many of the survivors of that campaign managed to escape to mainland China and join the British Army Aid Group, which was organised by the British Directorate of Military Intelligence Section 9, or MI9. They became resistance fighters, operating in enemy-occupied territory, a hugely dangerous task, carrying out sabotage and guerrilla warfare against the Japanese occupiers. Part of them were trained by the SOE, the famous Special Operations Executive, and even joined the, uh, the famous Chindits with ethnic Chinese men from both Hong Kong and mainland China amongst its ranks. Meanwhile, the war between Japan and China saw the Communist Party and the Nationalist Kuomintang agree a temporary ceasefire, creating a united front. The Roosevelt administration gave massive amounts of aid to Chiang's beleaguered establishment and created the Treaty for Relinquishing Extraterritorial Rights for Westerners in China. However, there was a growing sense that Kai-shek was more focused on defeating the Communists than the Japanese, and American General Joe Stilwell urged America to now start negotiating with the Communist Party instead. However, there were other Americans, such as Claire Shannon, who still argued for the Republic, and he also pushed for air power. He established the Flying Tigers, using American pilots and planes to modernise the ROC Air Force. They trained Chinese pilots in Burma, who flew alongside American colleagues in taking the air war directly to Japan. They took over 260 victories against the Japanese Air Force. The American pilots were later transferred back to the US Air Force, but the ROC could, not, could now contribute continuously to the war in Asia. The Chinese Civil War resumed after the end of the Second World War. The combined might of the British Empire, the US, China and other allies was required to defeat the Japanese, and the, and, but the victory couldn't resolve internal conflict within China. The British Empire had been virtually bankrupted by the World Wars and the US started to become a much more significant player in relations between China and the West. However, almost immediately, the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the, um, and the West boiled over into a hot war in Korea. The Communist leader Mao Zedong supported the North, as did the Soviet Union, whilst the United States and the British Empire supported the South. This conflict saw direct fighting between the Chinese uh, People's Liberation Army and Western armies. In 1950, the PLA decided that it had to modernise uh, its equipment and forces. It was largely equipped during the Second World War with antiquated weapons compared to the Western armies. But the Soviet army, first of all, began to um, equip them with weapons captured from the Japanese forces and then later with modern Soviet weapons. So they went from bolt-action rifles to the ubiquitous AK-47. Britain had initially offered to establish relations with the PRC in 1950, but China had refused over the issue of the UN seat representing China. Despite this, they sent a charge d'affaires to Peking. Formal relationships, however, weren't fully enacted until 1972 when they recognised the PRC's right to represent China and the UN for the first time. The Cultural Revolution in the 60s and 70s did have a negative impact. China's attacks, or Mao's attacks on capitalism in particular, uh, portrayed the West as, a, as a, um, a very negative influence. The movement paralysed China politically and significantly affected the country's economy and society and created hostility towards the West, particularly the US, who at that time were gripped by their reds under the bed's fear panic about the spread of Soviet communism and the Cuban Missile Crisis. It also spread into Hong Kong, where in 1967 there was pro-communist anti-colonial strikes inspired by the Cultural Revolution. Many of the rioters were actually quite peaceful, however there was a hardline uh, group who embarked on a bombing campaign that claimed the lives of many innocent victims. <coughs> 
In the 1970s, though, there was a rapprochement between the West and China and a normalisation of relations. In 1982, Margaret Thatcher and Zhao Ziyang began negotiations over the handover back to Hong Kong and signed the joint declaration. However, during that meeting in 1982, it was revealed that Chairman Deng told Thatcher that the PRC could simply invade Hong Kong if they wished to and were only honouring the 1997 agreement out of respect for Britain. It turned out in 2007 that those plans were very real and they'd been practised. So in 1997, there was the Hong Kong handover. Um, in that, in that uh, recent period as well, of course, there's been major Chinese economic reforms. Well, Shanghai is one of the strong symbols visually, as you can see there, of the economic growth and prosperity that China's been enjoying. Despite the, uh, uh, the liberalisation of the economy, the West does continue to criticise China's human rights record. Um, although, for the purpose of mutual benefit, there have been very significant steps forward, such as the Mutual Pledge of Closer Cooperation in 2011 between Britain and China. And current UK-China relations are uh, in a very positive way, despite some cultural misunderstandings. Growing Chinese power and influence throughout the world has seen Chinese foreign investment in almost all corners of the globe, and particularly in Africa and the Middle East. And that also extends to increasing their military influence. And one of the reasons we see the growth of port facilities um, that the um, Chinese mercantile interests and Navy users is because of that major, that uh, locality, major world trade routes. China has border disputes um, with several of its neighbours and there are ongoing issues related to the relationship between the West um, and China because of that. And of course China um, has continued that modernisation of its military. Since 2010 they've developed their own stealth fighter and a, now an aircraft carrier allowing China to be a much more significant regional power projector. As we see here now, China is one of the world's most powerful militaries and very much on a standing with the West's uh, most powerful militaries. And of course, is a nuclear weapon state. Why, uh, why is this uh, um, situation with the defense of trade routes so important? Well, it's about energy supply and demand primarily, and the major consumers and major suppliers there. Um, I'll just click forward, and finally, that brings us to the modern day. And we see US, um, one of China's primary partners, um, creating what they call their pivot to Asia. They've gone from being a supporter of China now to being fearful of China's uh, relationship with the West and are uh, trying a, a, a series of encirclements through uh, military alliances and basings in the region. And uh, I'll leave it there. So basically, just to sum up, um, throughout the 19th century and early 20th century in particular, there was a significant domination of China by Western influences and there's been a, a very um, significant rebalancing of that in recent years. And that's all.